I'm Ray Mears, and I'm on an adventure. There we go. I've been all over the world searching for wildlife and wild places, but I'm coming home to explore a place like no other. It's a wonderful river. It's dashingly as good as Lancashire, but not quite. <laughs> <laughs> You're incorrigible. <laughs> I'm travelling down a magnificent river from beginning to end to discover the life on... Peregrines are really noisy neighbours. I hope they shut up. I won't get any sleep. In... I think you put me in this one on purpose to try and get me wet. I'm not going to answer that question. <laughs> and around this wild and wonderful place... There's a kingfisher. Such beautiful oh, birds. They are absolutely fabulous. Look at that birds. stunning bird. It's getting better. I mean, it's just an incredible sight. It's like something out of Hitchcock. That's amazing. He's looking at you, kid. Come with me as I discover the mighty River Wye. I'd encourage you to come and explore this river. It's wonderful. These are the glorious hills in central Wales, close to Plinlimon. It's an incredible area. I love Wales. It's full of life. But of course, it rains here an awful lot. In fact, this area receives about three metres of rain per year. When it hits these hills and it runs down, it can form rivers. And believe it or not, this unlikely looking gully here is the source of one of our greatest rivers. The River Wye. The Wye starts here as a trickle, just a whisper, emanating from these rugged Welsh mountains. The river journey begins in these hills, meanders through England and Wales, before pouring into the Severn Estuary, a distance of 134 miles. At the foot of the hills, the river starts to take shape. The remote landscape flattens, and there's a stillness and purity to the pools that form here, home traditionally to the Wye's most iconic creature, the salmon. Good morning, Simon. Good morning. Good to see you. It's a lovely gravel bar, isn't it? I know. There's too few of them around. So tell me about the history, because we're close to the source of the Wye here. This used to be one of the most fantastic spectacles in the country used to be this place in autumn, when you would have these giant salmon that the Wye is famous for coming up here and spawning and splashing around in the shallows. And we lost them. Why? Um, predominantly due to acid water. The, the, the forests that you can see carpeting the hillsides, they scrub the acidity out of the air and then it washes off and it comes down in these acid flushes and it, it poisons the eggs of the fish. The absence of the salmon from the Wye seems unimaginable and Simon and his team have been working hard to bring it back. In 2001, they started adding lime, hoping to neutralise the acidity of the water, and they've been monitoring the river ever since. For years, we were looking at the same electrofishing results, zero, 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 and it was just depressing. In 2005, the electrofishing came back, and I opened the file, and I scanned through the results, and there was a zero, one, just one but it was that binary change, and suddenly we had gone from nothing to something. There was a fish alive in the upper Y, and it was, yeah, I was, I was stood up in my chair and jumped, and how just a single zero, zero to one can make a man so happy is ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. But this is a great success story, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. We didn't used to have fish here, and now we have got fish here. The balance of the river here has been restored. Today's catch shows salmon that has spawned here both this year and last. We've got some salmon fry in here, but crucially, we've got a salmon par as well. And he's almost ready to go. I mean, he's survived his first year, and about 90% of them die in the first year. And then next April, May, start to migrate down the river, disappear off into the North Atlantic, and then hopefully, cross our fingers, come back as a magnificent Y salmon. That's great, because nature, given a helping hand, is capable of recovery. Absolutely. This is the classic saying, nature abhors a vacuum. If you create the habitat, the fish will come. And do you think we'll see salmon runs in this stretch of river as they used to be? Um, we'll probably never get back to those heydays in the 1970s, but we've got back to a point now that last winter there were 25, 30 pairs of fish 
milling around in this pool here with the junction of the wine and threnig. We haven't got the bears yet, <laughs> <laughs> but we've got the salmon. It's fantastic. So there's hope. Much. Good luck. Yeah, very good luck. <laughs> As the river races away from the salmon's tranquil playground, it has become rocky and tempestuous. I'm following its path down to Nanurth. Here, the river carves its way through the rugged landscape of mid Wales, a scene that feels like it hasn't changed since the dawn of time. Well, I've come about 20 miles from the source. This valley is right next door to the Ellen Valley and it's very beautiful. The weather is a bit changeable. <laughs> Blue skies in one minute, raining the next. I'm going to camp here because the Y runs right down through here, and this area is particularly good for wetlands, and there's a good chance we might see some interesting dragonflies, and who knows what else. forward to tonight because I've got the chance to camp for the first time here beside the river on this trip. It's a lovely spot and of course this area gets horrendous rainfall so it's important not to just have a tent because the tent's all right to sleep in but a little hike tent's a bit miserable to live in so I'm going to put up a tarp as well to give me a space to uh, to exist under if you like. Get that over there. Four corners to a tarp obviously but I've only got two convenient corners to tie off to. So I cut some poles, a couple of hazel poles. It's really nice in Wales because you get the mountains and you get wooded valleys, which is how it should be, really. You haven't got the sheep nibbling back all of the young trees. That's looking quite good. That's me pretty well set up. I'll bring in my gear and then I'll think about lighting a fire. And right on cue, the Welsh weather lives up to its rain-soaked reputation. Not a moment too soon. Here comes the rain. Only problem is, I've only got half of my gear from the car, so I'll have to brave the rain to get the rest in, but that doesn't matter. Well, my camp is looking quite nice. The one thing that's missing is a fire, and every few times a year, I like to refresh old skills. In this case, I'm going to make the fire by friction. And that's a perishable skill. It's a skill that if you don't keep practicing it, you lose it. What I've got here is some bark, inner bark, from an oak tree, and I'm buffing it up into a tinder bundle. There are many different ways to make fire by friction, but the one technique that's still widely used around the world is the twirling of one stick against another between your palms. We call this technique the hand drill. And this is a hand drill set I've been using for some time. And I'll use it for some time to come because you can make fires from notches all the way along the side of the stick and then down the other side. So this apparatus is something you carry with you. And we'll go out where there's some sunshine. I've been making fire like this for well over 30 years. That's how you learn something, dedication. And first of all, I warm the sticks up. A little bit of smoke there. And the drilling is producing a hot powder, which is dropping into that little notch. Got a nice ember forming there now. Very carefully move the board away. And there's the ember. The tinder needs to be very tightly packed. Put the little ember in there, like that. And pinch it in, like this. There's a fire. 
I don't normally make fires on grass like this, but I've got no option here and I have permission. It'll be fine. The fire scar will, of course, recover in due course. It's looking pretty good. These bits of oak will burn nice and slowly with great heat. I won't need much of that. The river here feeds wetlands just beyond my camp, which are abuzz with the iridescent flashes of one of nature's most majestic insects, the aptly named dragonfly. Over a third of Britain's species can be found right here, and wildlife enthusiast Bob Dennison has caught some to show me. Dragonflies fascinate me. They have to be the most athletic insect, surely. They got really fast acceleration, superb aerobatic capabilities compared to most insects, but they need it because they need to be able to catch, um, you know, prey on the wings. They're catching, I've seen them taking uh, egg moths up on the moors, they take large butterflies. I mean, they are, I mean, God, they're, they're a super impressive predator. They are. As insects go, they're really the tigers of the sky, aren't they? Yeah, absolutely. Dragonflies hatch and grow as larvae underwater. For some species, this can take up to three years before they emerge as brutally effective carnivorous airborne hunters. And you just have to look at them to see why they're so efficient. Tell me about the eyes, because they're, they're fascinating. Well, they reckon that 80% of the dragonflies' uh, central nervous system is devoted to vision. And you can see with these big globular eyes, you know, they can, they've got great capability. Uh, they reckon something like 30,000 cells in each one of these on this, uh, this hawker. Uh, this one's trying to warm his wings up a little bit now and uh, warm his muscles up, ready to fly. He'd rather be away. Is he biting you? Uh, yeah, he's having a little nibble there. It just seems like a little reflex thing. I don't know why they do that. But they've got more than just those two huge eyes, haven't they? As far as dragonflies are concerned, they've got the two big wraparound eyes and then three smaller eyes at the sort of set at the front, which are for stability and kind of orientation, whereas the, the big wraparound eyes are the things that it really needs to find prey or to find a mate, because they've only got a few weeks that they're actually, you know, as airborne insects. To me, when you look at a dragonfly, who wouldn't be inspired by nature? That's more impressive than anything I see us design. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a design that sort of stood the test of 300 million years. Incredible. Yeah. As the sun sets over the Welsh mountains, it's almost time for me to turn in. But before I do, I'm setting up night cameras to see what happens here after dark. Well, it's been a fairly busy day, but a good one. It's nice to be here. Quite a flash camp, I have to say. But now the sun has gone down and night has drawn in, I really hear the sound of the river. Can't wait to see how the river changes as I pass down now from the upper reaches of the Wye to the more central regions. This spot is alive with nocturnal activity. Field mice, badgers and foxes scurry about my camp as I sleep. By morning, they'll be back in their burrows as I leave camp to witness something I've never seen before. I'm exploring the mighty River Wye from source to sea. The next stop for me is just outside the small, historic market town of Reda. Here, the river has been fed by water rolling off the Welsh mountains. It's gained momentum as it cuts through this wild and beautiful scenery. I've heard that just half a mile from the riverbank is a site I never thought I would see. This is Gigrin Farm. Hey, Chris. Very Hi. nice to meet you. Likewise. Why in time? Yes, we're feeling now in about 10 minutes' time. This is a rare and privileged sight. The sky is full of a very special bird of prey, the red kite. It's astonishing. I think they're going to polish your meat off quite quickly, aren't they? I think they are. Chris Powell is the owner of this red kite feeding station and provides food for these birds every day of the year. 80 years ago, this graceful bird almost became extinct 
and were nearly lost from our skies forever. Wow, this is a privileged view. Look at that. Awesome. The story of the Red Kite's demise is centuries old. Once common in towns and cities all over Britain, it was seen as vermin and hunted until it disappeared completely from England and Scotland and survived only in this part of Wales and only just. By the 1930s, there were only four birds remaining. All these kites could be derived from one single female. A German bird came in and bred and added a little bit of a uh, hybrid vigor. Spiced it up a little bit, which is good. Yes. This feeding station is the largest in Britain, and it has helped boost the local population to around 2,000 birds. So how did it all start? Quite by accident. Um, we normally fed the sheep up on that bank. To keep the crows away from the inland ewes, we'd encourage the dogs to catch rabbits and leave them up there. We came out from lunch one day, and uh, there were a couple of kites diving down on the rabbits. So my father went into the butcher and asked for some scraps. And that became a daily thing all through lambing. Year after year, they keep coming back. And how many birds do you get in here on a daily basis? There'll be three to 400 today. <laughs> um, if you came here when there was snow on the ground, there'd be over 600. Wow. Well, it's almost heart stopping, I mean. But they're very special. There's nothing like them, is there? You love the birds, don't you? I do, yes. This is our 22nd year. And every year it gets better and better. So the trees surrounding the clearing are now absolutely full of red kites. It's quite an extraordinary sight. Yes, yeah, so well, those, those will be the younger birds. There's a pecking order in the older birds come in first and then down through the, through the age groups. Ah, so they wait in their turn. Fascinating. So we've got a couple of buzzards down there now, getting a free meal as well, plucking the meat apart. Ooh. Ooh. A little bit of a dust up there. The buzzard came off better. It's like watching vultures on the Serengeti. Amazing. I visited this part of Wales as a young man 30 years ago and was desperate to see just one of these beautiful birds. I never imagined I would ever see so many at once in Britain. Having witnessed this astonishing spectacle, I can't help thinking that this is really something rather special. And if you're interested in nature or birds, this, this is a must-visit site. Just to be able to see this, it's, it's so special. I'm leaving the feasting kites to get back to the river near the town of Bilth Wells. Here you can feel the river maturing, glistening as it gathers pace, slicing through the dense foliage. It looks beautiful and abundant with life, but I want to take a closer look at the wildlife here to really gauge the health of the Wye. And to do that, you have to study the birds that depend on the river for survival. Professor Steve Ormerod and his team have been studying the bird population on this section of the Wye for the last 30 years. So I'm on a tributary of the Wye, and I have to say, this feels just like rainforest. It's beautiful, it's pristine. The guys have stretched a mist net across the river, and Steve is now going downstream to encourage any birds down there to fly upriver. There's a kingfisher. Oh, that's amazing. Wow. The net won't harm the bird. It's designed carefully just to hold it still so that it can be examined without causing any damage. We've just caught one of the most elusive birds on the river, the beautiful kingfisher. These stunning birds certainly live up to their name, spotting their prey and darting underwater in the blink of an eye. I've never been this close to a kingfisher. It really is a privilege. It's such beautiful birds. They are absolutely fabulous Look at that birds. stunning bird. Oh, oh, oh. oh, we've got a dipper. We have got a dipper. Oh, got two, a dipper. And, two, and two dippers. Two dippers, one in the water. Right, I'm going to go down and help. Hang on, sorry. <laughs> I'll hold on to that. Yeah. You're OK, Richard, yeah? Ah, oh, they're quick on the mark. That's good. Phew. <laughs> the acid rain that plagued the salmon upstream also had an effect on the birds here. And that's what makes the dippers so important, as they are incredibly sensitive to pollution. 
the things that dippers need, small mayfly nymphs, caddis, the kinds of snails and shrimps that they need to form eggs, calcium-rich prey, were completely wiped out almost by acidification. And when we actually looked at the effect on dippers, we found that they were far less numerous, they were laying fewer eggs, the young were surviving less well, and all of that essentially was a mechanism by which dippers actually told us about the health of river environment. You know, dippers are our equivalent of a, of a canary in a coal mine for the health and quality of river systems. So to see them flourishing here is heartwarming. They're wonderful to watch and get their name from the distinctive way they bob and dive. They're perfectly adapted to fast-flowing rocky rivers and can even walk, fly and hunt underwater. Steve, tell me about the eyelids, because I can see the, the white feathers there flashing. So the eyelid has little white feathers on it, and of course that, that matches the white breast, and both those features come into play when males are signalling perhaps against each other, so a bit of a territorial display, it's used in courtship. And their feet, they're specially adapted so you can grip the rock, because they literally walk underwater, don't they? Unlike birds that are swimming often and diving, they don't have web feet, they're not like a duck, but it's really well adapted to gripping on, sometimes to the bed of the river. So here are these feet, just tremendously adapted for, for gripping. Little tiny anti-slip pads also on the bottom of the feet. I've watched them for hours on rivers. They're just stunning to, to, to see them at work, but I've never been this close. Look at that. Now I'm heading to the wise only city, Hereford, and I've brought along an old friend to join me, my trusty canoe. So much life here. Swans, cygnets, geese, swallows coming down, and all the vegetation as well. Rivers truly are the lifeblood of the countryside, the arteries of our land. Just up here, I'm going to cross from Wales into England. You never know, we might get an improvement in the weather. Although no my luck, it'll be the other way around. <laughs> As I approach Hereford, the character of the river has changed completely. It has mellowed and broadened fattened by its many tributaries and streams, a picture postcard view of an English river. But it wasn't always this way. Once this river was a bustling highway for trade and commerce. So I'm going back in time and jumping ship onto a classic Y working boat. Wow, look at this. This is quite a vessel. Well, welcome on board. Good Very to nice you. to meet you. Nice to see you. The Hereford Bull is a replica of an 18th century flat bottom barge called a Tro that once brought this river to life. She handles very well. Just keep over on the starboard side of the channel. That's it. Today she is captained by Philip Wilcox and his crew of local sea cadets. You're a nautical man, aren't you? I am. Yeah, I was in the Navy for 37 years. Ended up as, as head of the surface Navy. Amazing. What was your rank? Admiral. So this is your latest command. This then. is my command. A bit different. <laughs> well, that's lovely, though, isn't it? A bit different between right? the ships I commanded were destroyers. So uh, five and a half thousand tons doing 30 knots, four tons doing five knots. <laughs> <laughs> okay, lads, get ready to put the mast up. The river was the economic hub for this part of the country for nearly 500 years. All local industries depended on the tro to transport their goods. So, Philip, tell me about the history of the tro. These were the HGVs of their day. They would take cider, iron ore, coal from the Forest of Dean down to Chepstow, and then they'd bring their valuable goods back in, cloth, wine. And because the goods coming up the Y were downside more expensive than the goods going down the Y, uh, that's when piracy would... Um, river piracy? River piracy on the River Wye in the 18th and um, early part of the 19th century. How are they powered? The traditional method of powering was man-hauling, uh, because manpower was cheaper than 
horsepower in this area of the country. And so they put a line from the top of the mast onto the riverbank, and up to 20 man hauliers would haul the boats up and down. And obviously, in those days, they'd have to keep the riverbanks clear of all the vegetation. The riverbanks were OK. You wouldn't have had all this willow that you see here. Yeah. I'd like to picture the days when these were plying their trade and the, the, the hard life that the boatmen in those days must have had. Well, the Trow crew would have been a skipper plus a, a young teenager, probably much younger than the sea cadets we've got on board today, 12, 13. And just the two? Just the two of them. And they'd sleep in a cabin, which would be um, effectively underneath here. Amazing. The use of these boats declined as other modes of transport became available. However, some remained to ferry the Victorian well-to-do as tourism first hit the wine. People would come to Hereford and then get into a passenger trow and then go all the way down to Chepstow past Tinton when the River Wye became used for tourism. And it's now tourism it tends to be the main activity on the river. Some uh, racing rowers there. See if we can catch up with the rowers now. It's time for me to leave the old Wye workhorse behind and head on downstream to meet a man who for years has protected the river from some of its more unsavoury characters. I'm exploring the mighty River Wye from beginning to end. I'm now two thirds into my journey and next I'm heading to Lower Lidbrook. Here the river is majestic as it swoops through Ross on Wye and loops alongside the limestone gorges, cutting through the forest of Dean. This stretch of river was famed for its huge salmon and attracted fishermen from far and wide, though not all were welcome. So, George, you're going to give me a tour of your beat on the river? Oh, we'll go and have a look. George Woodward has spent his working life here as a water bailiff, protecting the wire from poachers and as a fishing guide, river life is his passion. I had just thoroughly loved fishing in the outdoors. I can remember to this day, the first time the little red float went boom. And there attached to the end of the line was a little perch about that big, which went home in a tin can and lived in the sink in the wash house for three years. <laughs> George first came to the Y in 1976 from his beloved Lancashire. Then the river was a very different place. We would have been catching, when I first came here, 200 salmon a year off this beat. Uh, by the time I finished fishing full time on the beat, we was down to 70 to 80 fish a year. You must have had to deal with poachers, surely. I started on the river in the days when there was still a lot of salmon in the Y. Major poaching problem. They were absolute down and out rogues, criminals. They absolutely pillaged the Y for a period of time. I've seen the biggest salmon I've ever had my hands on come out of a poacher's net, and there was more than one or two cases on the Y where 100 and odd salmon in a night. None of them had any love or respect for the fish they slaughtered. Poaching is no longer a problem on George's beat. So now he gets to spend his time indulging his passion. Bit of great life. I don't think anybody making a start today would ever have the enjoyment, the satisfaction, or the pleasure that I've had out of this river. I've been very, very lucky. The upper Wye's got its beauty, but I don't think it's quite the same as the lower Wye. It's a wonderful river. It's dashingly as good as Lancashire, but not quite. <laughs> You're incorrigible. <laughs> That's the word, isn't it? <laughs> now I'm pressing on alone to a very special place where I will be spending the night. I'm heading now, in the last little part of the paddle, to Simmons Yacht, which is uh, a very famous part of the Y and there are some peregrine falcons that nest there. And I'm hoping that I may be able to see some of their uh, acrobatics while I'm there. In fact, I'm going to camp there tonight with just that intent. Can't wait. 
with all these magnificent trees on the river here, it feels very wild. It reminds me of jungle rivers, really, to be honest with you, all these broadleaf trees, the way they come down over the river. It's lovely. There's Sim and Jat, look at that, perfect. And I have special permission to camp right underneath it. That should give me perfect views of any peregrine activity. Fortunately, my canoe is an amphibious creature and can travel as well on land as water, with a little help. There's the peregrine site. This is where my camp is going to be. And I'm going to make a traditional canoe camp using the canoe as one feature of the shelter. Using your canoe like this for shelter is a Native American tradition and a great way to camp when traveling by canoe. All I need is my trusty tarp, there. some cord, and my ax for making tent poles and pegs and the paddles can even be used as extra support. With a few natural resources and a bit of elbow grease, it's an ancient version of a pop-up tent, but much more authentic and certainly more comfortable. There we go. So the canoe's at the back there. That makes a handy shelf. And I've got an open-fronted lean-to. If the weather's really inclement, you can ditch the poles and literally just pitch the top down to the ground. But uh, mostly this will will work just perfectly. But I'm using this today because it gives me this glorious view of the Peregrine site. Absolutely ideal. I love watching Peregrines. These birds are phenomenal hunters, one of the fastest in the animal kingdom, and they need to be. That screeching you can hear is the young chicks demanding to be fed, and it's deafening here in my camp. It's fantastic all afternoon. I've had peregrine action here. This is a beautiful spot, and to make it even better, I found growing here this. This is soapwort, and that is, as its name suggests, really good for making soap, which is perfect because it's really important to take care of yourself when you're out. And of course, when you're wet all day, the most important thing to take care of are your feet. A bit of hot water, crush it up, squeeze it, and the soap comes out of it. Now, I can wash my socks, which is great. So quick rinse with some soap work, accompanied by the ever present peregrines and then I'll hang those up to dry. Because I've just come down from Wales on the Y, I thought why not make some Welsh cakes? And that's my plan. This is of course an ancient secret Welsh recipe. But, um, quick search on the internet these days you can find your own secret Welsh recipe. Half the fun. My recipe is simple. Flour, sugar, cinnamon, and nutmeg. A bit of butter and lard. Some raisins and an egg to bind. Peregrines are really noisy neighbors. I hope they shut up. I won't get any sleep. Pan off. Mix it all up, roll it out, and chop into biscuit-sized slices. Nice sound, isn't it? That pan is quite hot, so... And cook for a moment. I know that all the women of Wales be going, they don't have a Welsh cake should look. They probably aren't, but that's my bush version. I'm sure they'll taste delicious because it is an authentic Welsh recipe. And with the sunlight fading, it's time for some mood lighting, bush style. It's nice when you're camping out like this to have some candlelight. It's quiet, there's no nasty smell. Looks really well. And a bit of birch bark 
wrapped around a candle in a split stick. Makes a very neat and handy candle holder. Mm, tastes good. The Forest of Dean is one of the few surviving ancient woodlands. And as I turn in for the night, the woods around me come to life. It's a rare treat to see deer and even wild boar foraging for food after dark. For the next part of my journey, I'm going to be traveling downriver on one of the rarest boats you'll ever see, but one that was seen on the Wye for thousands of years. What a lovely day to go on the river. Oh, beautiful. These strange-looking vessels are called coracles. Well, it floats like a leaf, Peter. Oh. And Peter Faulkner has been making them for 30 years. Today, he's showing me how to paddle them. Right then, you said step backwards, yeah? Yep, don't, le don't lean backwards. No, here we go. Whoa, it's tippy. Yeah, put the flat, flat face towards you. Ooh. <laughs> they are very, very tippy, aren't they? This is not such an easy no. shape to move, is it? A bit of a longer, nice, nice, long and steady. And lean forward a bit and dig in. That's brilliant. That's good. So these boats stretch way back in history? Yes, they go back way beyond the sort of sea boat, but the coracle is far more ancient, it's got to be. You could be talking 20, 30,000 years. We, we don't know. Theoretically, you could have found these boats on every British waterway. Yeah, they were widespread. They would have been common throughout the British Isles, I'm sure. What were they used for, Peter? Well, prehistorically, they would have been used as a means of transport, uh, probably for spearing fish. Yeah. And there was a tradition there of catching salmon with these boats. I'm getting the feel now for the boat. I've got more control. It takes a little while to settle in to any boat. I think so, yeah. The beauty of this craft is its simplicity. For centuries, the framework has been made from willow, woven with hazel and covered in watertight animal hide. And Peter makes them exactly the same way today. It's lovely to sit in a boat made with all natural materials. All the materials that I use are, are gathered locally. It all comes from the local woods and the fields. The hides come from local cattle, which go to the butchers next door to my workshop. It's all homegrown. Light enough to be carried on your back and easy to manoeuvre, these agile, portable boats are perfectly suited for river fishing and were a common sight on the Wye until a century ago. I'm starting to get the feel of the boat. It's subtle, isn't it? Yeah, that's If you get it I, I right, think... it doesn't spin around all the time, unless you want it to. It's such just a flick of the paddle. It's awesome. Yeah, no effort at all. Very manoeuvrable. I think I'll do that again. That was fun. Getting adventurous. Oh, a bit of fast water. The adrenaline starts to pump. I think you put me in this one on purpose to try and get me wet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to answer that question. <laughs> as much as I've enjoyed my time pootling down this part of the river, it's about to dramatically change. So for the final leg, I'll be needing a more sturdy mode of transport. I'm on the final leg of my journey down the majestic River Wye. It has now taken me back into Wales, heading for Chepstow. Here the force of tide is really taking hold, churning up the muddy riverbed. The colour has darkened and the pace and power intensified, ready for the final sprint into the Severn estuary and off out to sea. But first I'm heading to a small wood in the Lower Wye Valley to meet a group of people who are working tirelessly to protect a very special mammal. To take a closer look at them, they are setting up huge nets and waiting for nightfall. I am, of course, bat hunting. 
What have you got here then, Steve? So this is a, a brown long-eared bat. This is actually a juvenile bat at the moment, so it can't actually fly properly yet. And tell me about the ears, because they're fascinating. It's got yeah, big eyes too. Aren't they? This species of bat's probably got the biggest eyes of all the bats yeah. at, uh, in, in comparison to the body. I mean, it's, it really gives it real, real personality in the face it as well, does. doesn't it? This one, yeah, he's, uh, I don't think you can see that or not. Just watch your fingers, Ray. Yeah, I'm not going to, I'm not going <laughs> to, no. He might. He's like got very sharp teeth. They have they? got very sharp teeth and they do like chomping on fingers. <laughs> These bats use echolocation to navigate and hunt prey. They bounce high-frequency sounds that are inaudible to humans off objects to map out their environment. And the key to this is their highly developed hearing. The ears are enormous uh, and the eyes are enormous because this bat has evolved to be flying around in woodlands. It doesn't really echolocate that much. It uses its ears. Can you just see that little pointy bit there? Yep. And that's called a tragus. And what that does is amplifies the sound. So the bats can hear any, anything in a woodland. I mean, they can literally pick up, a, pick up the sound of a spider on a leaf, uh, go down to it, hover above it, and then glean it off the leaf in pitch black. So if you can just see how big the ear is. I mean, it's huge. It's massive. I mean, yeah. it's what, three it's times the size of the head? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, well, it'll be interesting to see what we find tonight. There's bats flying now as we're speaking, so um, we should be quite lucky. This one just come across here now. So, yeah, it's time to start checking the nets, I think. The perfect combination of the river and these woods provides plentiful insects and habitat for these bats to flourish. The volunteers tonight are doing one of their regular surveys, which means giving the bats a checkup, and I'm listening out for them. So, on the advice of the local experts, I've got my bat detector set at 80 kilohertz, and I've already got a little bit of clicking registering right on cue. And it's not long before the nets do their job. How are we doing? I think he's gone in here. What have we got here? This is long, long, long eared. It is, yes. They're so beautiful. They are, aren't they? Yeah. Um, people are, you know, people, you often hear people say they're afraid of bats, but if you see one up close, you couldn't possibly be. It's so beautiful. My little fella. <laughs> the species of bat is logged its gender and age noted, and its weight is recorded. And here we go, for the weighing. And that is 14.4. 14.4 grams. And how much does that bag weigh? Seven. <laughs> Seven grams. There you go. So that bat weighs the same as a sandwich bag. It just shows you how delicate they are. Quite astonishing. And what would the life expectancy be? Well, in the wild, it's difficult to say, um, but in captivity, they probably live well in excess of 10 years. Amazing. He's looking at you, kid. I'm almost at my journey's end. Just a few miles remain before the Y pours into the Severn estuary and races out to sea. Here, the full force of the tide has taken hold, and the waters are wild and dangerous. So I've traded in my canoe for something a little more powerful. Well, to finish my journey down the Y, I'm hitching a, a ride, a bit cheeky, really, in this rescue boat. But it makes a change to have a couple of engines and even a coxswain to uh, pilot me down the river. But it also makes good sense because at this point the river Wye is tidal and you can't underestimate the power of the tide. The riverbanks here are peppered with ancient fortifications like Chepstow Castle, remnants of the historic frontier between England and Wales. And upstream is Tintern Abbey, which has stood defiantly on this riverbank for almost 800 years. It seems to me that the church really knew how to pick a good campsite. As we push on downstream, the influence of the tide is really taking hold of the boat. The water here is treacherous, and that's where volunteers like skipper Ryan Hewitt and his crew come in. Well, the tide's really dropping, isn't it? Just in the time we've been coming down the river, it looks like a metre and a half, maybe two metres. 
quite easily. Um, it drops very, very fast, the tides in this part of the world, and we can uh, expect a tidal range at times up to about 14 metres. 14 metres. Amazing. So tell me about Sara. Sara, or the Seven Area Rescue Association, was founded in the early 1970s to provide lifeboat and rescue cover to a part of the country that, that had none. We also deal with mountain rescue and land search as well as swift water rescue. So it's a very, um, very diverse range of skills that the personnel we have yeah. possess. Finally, after 134 miles, my journey on this river is coming to a spectacular end. At the beginning, the voice of the river is a whisper carving its way through some of the wildest parts of Britain. And here at the end, the river's whisper has become a roar. Well, here I am at the end of the River Wye, about to empty out into the River Severn and the Severn Estuary. I'd encourage you to come and explore this river. It's wonderful. It started with a tiny trickle of rain fed spring water, and now the camera crew are struggling to keep their feet on this rim as the mighty River Wye enters the Severn. This has been a fantastic journey, and it reminds me just how much I enjoy Britain. Well, Chaz is in for a shock when she hooks up with an old flame tonight in Emmerdale in 25 minutes. Then in Coronation Street at 7.30 and 8.30, Carla makes her demands to Johnny Clear and the two soaps go head to head later. It's the big quiz Coronation Street v Emmerdale at 9. Before all that, this New Year's Day. The latest ITV News is next. <laughs>